Well, good morning. I hope everybody had a great Thanksgiving. And we welcome you to the Odyssey Church. For those of you who may not know me, I think everybody does, but I'm Rob Welch. I'm the, the lead pastor here at the Odyssey. And I just want to take time to thank you for coming out this morning. It means a great deal for us. And if you had Thanksgiving and you weren't sure of what to be thankful for, just do like this and check the box. Because it means you're still living, which means there's still time for all kinds of things. One of the things that I found in churches is that sometimes it's hard for people to get connected. So we ask you to fill out our connection card. We don't do that so we can send you a lot of information, but simply we want to get to know you and we want you to get to know us so that maybe you'll see if the Odyssey Church is a place that uh, you want to hang out a little bit more. So while you're filling those out, I want to tell you a little bit about why today is so special. If you ever go to the store and you buy a church calendar, you'll see that our church calendar doesn't match our regular calendar that we use you know, on our walls at home. The church calendar starts today. Church calendar always starts with an event called Advent. Today is the first day of Advent, which means it's the first day on a church calendar, which means today is actually New Year's Day in the church. Now, Advent is a very, very important time of year because it's not a holiday season. It is the Christmas season that we begin today. And that's important for two reasons. First of all, uh, that means there's only three more Sundays until Christmas. I don't know if you realize that yet, but 7th, 14th, 21st, Christmas. You had three more weeks of Christmas shopping, and it's over and done with until next year. But the real reason we celebrate this time of year is not because of a holiday called Christmas, but because of an event that actually took place in history. An event that was so powerful, that was so exciting, that was so large, that it actually changed the way we measure time. All the time, all around the world, is measured in B.C. and A.D. B.C. for before Christ, and A.D., which is Latin for an anno Domini, which means uh, in the year of our Lord. So if you read old papers at the beginning of our, uh, of our history, even here in the United States, it'll say, you know, for example, the November the 11th, 2014, and the year of the Lord, 2014. So everything that we do worldwide is based on an actual event that took place in history, and that is the coming of God himself. God who came to walk among his people. Uh, some churches, this one included sometimes, we, we sort of narrow it down and say God in a body. He came to be with his people so that we wouldn't have just information. Because we can read the scriptures and have information. He came so we could know the living God. He came so we could... See the love and the mercy and the grace of God through God himself, Jesus Christ. And Advent is a, also a Latin term. It means Adventus, or it comes from the word Adventus. It means the coming. And it's said that we live in the already, but not quite yet. Because we live in this time where God has already come to walk among his people, and he came as a baby, yet we live in the not quite yet. Advent is a time that we celebrate the coming of God and all that that meant. It's a time we celebrate the presence of God and all that means. But it's a time of expectation. It's a time when we look forward to, with great expectation, the hope that we have in Jesus Christ of His coming once again, just as He promised He would. So today, we celebrate that event with what's called an Advent wreath. And this is the wreath. Each thing has a, a different meaning. The, uh, the cedar was a, uh, a, a kingly, a royal type of evergreen. It, it, it meant uh, continual life because it was always green, even throughout the winter months. It's in a circle to show the uh, infinity of God, no end, no beginning. The holly leaves come along and they celebrate the richness and the berries and then the ivy. And we'll get into a little bit more about what each thing means as, as the season of Advent comes along. But at this time, we're going to light the first candle. And although we're going a little bit out of order of traditional churches, we're going to light the candle of peace. And to do that, we're going to ask Sonia Dory to come up and explain a little bit about what all that means. Um, good morning to all. Uh, today we begin our celebration of Advent. On the four days uh, leading up to Christmas, the four Sundays, we will rejoice in a great gift 
that is ours in Jesus Christ. To help us celebrate, we'll be, we will be lighting candles of the Advent wreath. The candles signify that Jesus is the light of the world. Each Sunday, we will light an additional candle. Then, on our Christmas service, Sunday on the 28th, we will light all of the candles, including the center one, the Christ candle. The, uh, as we do, we will rejoice that Christ has come to us. On the first Sunday of Advent, we will light the candle of peace. Jesus is our peace. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 14 reads, For Christ himself has brought peace to us. He united the Jews and Gentiles into one people when in his own body on the cross he broke down the wall of hostility that separated us. He is the Prince of Peace. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, for a child is born to us, a son is given to us. The government will rest on his shoulders, and he will be called a wonderful counselor, a mighty God, an everlasting father, and the prince of peace. And the fruit of his presence is peace. Galatians chapter 5, verse 22. But the Holy Spirit produces the kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, and faithfulness. Jesus, we pray, guide our feet into the path of peace and continually grant us peace in every situation.
You cannot have a peace in your life. You cannot have an understanding of what we're about. You cannot have an understanding of what Christ is doing in your life without truly knowing Him. Without truly knowing that He is the one who is in charge. No matter what battles you're going through, no matter what disdainment you may have in your life, no matter what things you feel are just trying to tear you down and weigh you down, you know that God is still in control. Well, we ask the question, well then, why am I struggling? I can't answer that right now. But there will be a time when I walk through those pearly gates that I will have all the answers to all the questions I've had all my whole eternal life. I am so thankful today that I have battled things that people said could not be done because of the grace and the power of God Almighty. I have been given a grace and an understanding and a peace that people who have not gone through cannot begin to understand. I was diagnosed with stage four colon and rectal cancer, December the 28th of uh, 2011. When the doctors brought me out of the surgery that day, he walked into the operating room, from the operating room to the waiting room where my mother and my aunt and my daughter was. And the news wasn't good. And God Almighty began to reach down his hand. And God began to touch my body in ways that I had never experienced myself before. I've been a, a Christian since I was 35 years old. I have been in terrible truck accidents. I was a truck driver. Um, I have been put in places where I did not believe I would ever make it out again. But I'm thankful to God that through His grace, through His abundance, through His peace, and through His understanding, that I am now able to stand before you and let you know that God is alive and well today. Amen. To look at me, you can't tell there's anything wrong with me. But there is. When I was diagnosed with cancer, the cancer had eaten through the colon and eaten through the rectum. And I had estrogen all through the lower part of my body. And the two and a half hour surgery, three hour surgery began to be a five hour surgery because they had to clean so much of that stuff out of me. And the doctors came out and said, there is no guarantee that he will come out of this hospital alive. I was supposed to be in the hospital five days, maybe six days. I was in the hospital 14 days. Supposed to be in recovery for four weeks. Was in the hospital eight weeks. I was in recovery for eight weeks. And I stand here before you today with thanksgiving and joy in my heart because I not only am able to, to be able to praise God and sing His praises and thank Him for what He's done, but I'm thankful for the changes that He has made in not just my life, but in my children's lives through this experience. He has drawn us oh so close together. It's an honor today to have my children here, my son-in-law Danny and my daughter Candace, my son-in-law to be Chuck, and my daughter Sonia, our grandchildren, my girlfriend Donna, and uh, Alex, and Miranda, and Elizabeth, and where's Emily? There's Emily, and there's Charlie Joe, and uh, that's just part of them. But today I want to share with you that you can have an understanding of what God's doing in your life and still not know what God's doing in your life. What we have to do is learn what trust is. Without that trust in the hand of God as he reaches down and touches your life and your heart and your mind and your soul, you have to freely let go. One of the hardest things we as Christians have to do today is to let go and let someone else do what God's doing. Amen. That's a little better. Are you all right? Can you hear me okay? Do I need a microphone this morning? No. No. Wait, look. I'm so thankful today that I had the privilege to witness while I was in the hospital. And through that witness, three of my nurses 
uh, here just a few weeks ago, began to take care of me, and I found out who their families were, and knew their families, and knew them when they were little children, but we had lost contact over the years. The devil, in his infinite wisdom, has tried to tear me down in so many ways. Valentine's Day of 2013, I was in a horrific car accident. I was rear-ended by a vehicle, and the doctor said that I was in really, really bad shape, and I was, uh, I was destined to a life of pain. that I probably wouldn't be able to do a lot of things that I had done in the rest of my life or previous part of my life. But because of God's wisdom and God's inherent love and peace and understanding, God saw me through that. And God began to heal my body one piece at a time. And during that time, I began to see things through God that I had not noticed before. They were all there but I had not noticed them before. And I'm thankful today that I opened my eyes again to the peace that only God can give. And that was such a great feeling. Such a great feeling. Today, as I sit here before you, I begin to understand that no matter what we are doing ourselves, we are nothing. We cannot do or be anything that God wants us to do or be without His grace and without His peace and without His comfort. I want you to also know that if you don't know peace, you can't know God. I'm talking about the K-N-O-W. You have to be able to know Him. And knowing something is not just, yeah, I know we have a God and I know He created the universe and I know that God is here in control. But we have to be able to let go and let God take control and take charge of every piece of our life. Of every little minute part of our life, we have to let go and let God. We have to realize that in this day and time, the devil is going to be there tearing us down, offering us things that we never ever thought possible, because they're not. Anything that is not from God Almighty is not possible. God is in control. God is in charge. God wants us to rely on Him. God wants us to obey Him. God wants us to trust Him. Now, I want to ask you if you understand what trust really is. Trust is something that I had a hard time to deal with for many years. I've always been a big man. I'm six foot one. I have, because of the cancer, lost down to 258 pounds. I was 340 pounds some four years ago. And I thank God for what he brought me through in the midst of all that. But more than that, I thank God today that he has opened my eyes to see it doesn't matter how big you are, there's always somebody bigger. There's always somebody better. There's always somebody who's more man than you are. There's always somebody who can do more than what you can do. And I thank him for that this morning. I lift him up this morning, not because of what I am able to do, but because of what I have allowed him to do through my life. I was in the hospital with some serious heart troubles. I had, like the pastor said, stage four cancer, and they were giving me all kinds of chemotherapy and saying that that would take care of it, that would take care of it, that would take care of it, and nothing was working. Nothing could honestly, sincerely take care of the cancer that I had. I was given a point in my life where nothing was working. Nothing could take care of the cancer that I had except the mighty hand of God. And while I was in the hospital, the nurses kept telling me it's going to be all right. It's going to be all right. Well, a couple of the nurses that I hate were having a hard time understanding why I wasn't concerned, why I wasn't worried, because I know my hands we're in the hand of God. I know that God was taking care of me and I know that God was in charge and in control of everything that was going on in my life. This morning, as I begin to, or this week rather, as I begin to look through the scriptures and begin to ponder in my mind why God had chosen me to go through and 
continue in the path I had continued. Why he didn't just reach down and heal me instantly, which he can do. And I found out recently that it's because of the people's lives that I'm touching and changing every day as I walk around the street. It's a mighty, mighty thing for you to have someone come up to you and say, God bless you. And I say, no, God bless you more. And they look at me like, why would you want God to bless me more than he blesses you? Because you don't know what I've been through. And I would not wish what I have been through on any man, woman, child on this earth. I understand now what real pain is like. I understand today that there is a point in your life when you just want to give up. When you just want to say, I can't do this anymore. I, I hurt so bad. I can't hurt anymore, God. I don't want any more of this pain. I don't want any more of this that I've had to go through. I don't want any more of this real pain. I don't want any more of this aggravation. I don't want any more of his suffering. And then I stop and I look at what suffering he went through as a man here upon this earth. And I thank him every day for every drop of blood that he shed because it wasn't just for me, but it was for every single person who walked the face of this earth. And even above and beyond that, it was for those who were not born yet. It was those who were not coming yet. And I thank him for those things. But most importantly this morning, I want you to understand that God is alive and well in your soul if you let him. You see, we have to take our hearts and place them out here and let God reach out and touch our hearts with his plan. See, it's not about what we want. It's not about what we desire. But it's what God's plan has been written down throughout the years of life. There comes a time in your life when you just decide, well, you know, I've done all the things I can do. I hear this some older people all the time, and I just turned 60 a couple weeks ago. And people were amazed that I am able to look the way that I look at the age of 60. But it's all because of the grace and power and peace of God Almighty that I'm able to do what I do. This morning, as we come together to fellowship and to worship and to love what he has done and what he is doing, I want you to look at some scriptures. We just had the scriptures up here. I'm going to read Matthew 5. I can find it here. It'll be on the PowerPoint, I believe, Pastor. There it is. During the boat, okay. We're going to start reading on chapter 5. And it says, Seeing the multitudes, he went up into a mountain. And he, when he was set, his disciples came to him. And he opened his mouth and thought them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, and they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness sake, for their heart, for, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are we when man shall revile you and persecute you and shall say a manner of you and shall you all manner of evil against you be false. For my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great 
is your reward in heaven. And so persecuted they the prophets which before you ye are the salt of the earth but if the salt have lost its savor wherewith shall it be salted? And it is thenceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and to be tendered under the foot of men. You are the light of the world. The city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel. For they under the bushel put on a candlestick that he giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Let's think about that just a little bit. If you stop and think about the first few verses, blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. It doesn't matter what you have down here because life is eternal. So we have greater riches and greater things stored above for us in heaven. And that's a great and mighty thing. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. How great it is to be comforted by the hand and by the power of God. Yeah. There are nights when I wake up and I just cannot understand why I'm hurting so bad. And then I begin to talk to God, and I begin to pray, and I begin to thank Him, and I begin to praise Him. And I begin to say, Lord, why am I having to go through this? And He simply says, Your strength is my grace. Your strength is the healing of someone else who is alive and well and doing worse than what you are be hurting worse than I'm hurting right now. And it's a great and mighty thing when he reaches his hand down and touches that part of my body that's hurting and begins to make it feel better. It's an awesome thing to feel his presence and his power. It's an awesome thing to feel the glory of God fill the room. And then you know that his peace and his comfort and his glory is there for all things and all people to receive. If you look at the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. What a glorious thing it is to be meek and mild and lowly. It's hard for us to understand in our finite minds what God has in store for us and what God has for us to do each and every day of our lives. But if we stop and look at what he has brought us through, and some people don't understand, but I do a lot of reading in Job. And these last few months, Job has brought me through so many things. The story talks about Job and the boils he had and how he had to sometimes just take a shell and scrape them to get the sap to come out, to get the juice to come out, and to get the things to come out of his body because he was in so much pain. And I think, wow, I don't understand how a man can go through something like that. But he did. And what I had to go through is just a tiny drop in the bucket to what we may have to go through. But I'm thankful to still be there. I'm thankful to still be in his grace and his love. Only his peace can pass all understanding. And it's great to be in the loving arms of God. We look over on to verse number 7, and it says, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall attain mercy. We have the mercy of God and the mercy of grace in our life each and every day. We just need to learn how to hold on to it, how to reach down and pick up his love and his grace and mercy and peace with his love and his abundance. And that's something that's hard for us to do because, like I said a while ago, I'm a big man. 
And I've always been used to doing things for myself. And I'm thankful today that he has shown me through this battle, that he has shown me where to go, how to go, what to do, and what not to do. And continue to stay in that path of righteousness. It's difficult many times for us as humans because we want to do it ourselves. That's how we're taught. Well, we can do this. We got this. We don't need no help from nobody else, but we do. We need God. We need His love. We need His grace. We need His mercy. We need His understanding. We need each and every day of our lives to be filled with Him. And I'm so thankful today that He has taught me over the years, not just my Christian years, but that he has taught me that it's not an easy thing to humble yourself down and allow someone else to do for you and to do and be all there is for you to do and be and have. But most of all, it's even better to receive that inner blessing, to receive that peace that we're talking about, to receive that feeling of understanding that God is in control. It's hard for us to understand today that God has given us so much. God has given us so many wonderful things that we have yet even begin to comprehend in His finite wisdom. And we are able to continue on in His love. I'm thankful today for what He's doing from my life for what he's doing for my family's life and for what he's doing for the life of my grandchildren. The other day we were at the house and I was having a really, really bad day and I said to my granddaughter and I said, Emily, Papa's feeling really bad. Would you pray for Papa? And I figured she would say okay and then, you know, just go off. But she took my hand and she prayed the most beautiful prayer I've heard a child pray in my whole entire life. And it touched my heart because my children are being brought up in the way that they were brought up. And I thank God for that every day. And I'm just so joyful today to have a Christian family. I have one daughter that needs a lot of prayer because she doesn't yet know the knowledge of God. But God is working on her. She sent me a letter the other day. And she actually apologized in this letter. And she said, Dad... I just can't say enough words to thank you. I let Pastor Rob read it. And I can't I understand why it's taken me so long to realize that you were trying to teach me the things that you had been through in all your life. That's what we are. We are teachers. We are people who are trying to get our children to understand that there are so many glorious things out here in this life that we live and walk every day. There are so many things that we don't understand, even as adults. I don't know everything. I may have four years of college. I may have five years of seminary. I don't understand everything. But I do know that God is alive and well. I do know that God is a God of love, that God is a God of peace and understanding, that God is a God that will, no matter how many times we fall down and stumble, that He will pick us up, that He will continue to guide us, that He will give us the strength and the comfort and the joy that we need to carry us through each and every day. I'm so happy today that God has allowed me to come and share this little bit about peace because these next couple verses, it says in verse number 10, Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs it is the kingdom of heaven. Wow. We're going to be persecuted all the days of our life while we're here upon this earth. I don't understand that either. I don't understand either. 
but I know that God is in control. It says in verse number 12, Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is the reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. And they are the salt of the earth, but the salt have lost its savor. Wherefore shall it be salted? It is therefore good for nothing. It is henceforth good for nothing, but to be cast out and to be thrown out and cast out and cast out and to be trodden under our feet. We need to realize that the path that we're trodden is just the beginning. Because this path has been trod many, 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 many times before us each and every day. And we need to understand that we're just laying down a path for someone else to travel. A path for someone else to see and understand. We all have treasures that are hidden, that are just waiting for us to reach out and get a hold of them. But we've got to draw ourselves closer to God. We've got to have the peace of God. We've got to have the true, true love of God in our hearts. We want to turn now, if you would, to chapter number 13, verses number 44, 45, and 46. And it says, Again, the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in the field. In which when a man has found it, hideth and for joy thereof goeth and selleth all that he hath and buyeth that field. And again, the kingdom of heaven is like to a merchant man seeking godly peril. Who, when they had found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had and bought it all. Be careful what you buy today. Be careful you don't buy into the wrong episode. Be careful you don't buy into the wrong plate of food. Be careful you don't buy into the things that are not of heavenly things. But always remember, when you buy, buy into the heavenly goals, the heavenly Father, buy into the kingdom. And then when you buy into the kingdom, you'll receive that peace, you'll receive that understanding, you'll receive that joy that no one can take away no matter what. The devil can come against you. He can hurt you. He can harm you. He can do things to you that you just do not understand. But I guarantee you, standing before you here today, the devil will never, ever be able to do more harm to you than God can do to you. I give you my word on it. It's awesome to have been able to share with you today. Thank you today for the privilege and honor to be able to share in a few words. And I hope that you receive something from this today. And I thank God for the honor and for the privilege. And I ask two things today. That you spend more time praying each and every day of your life. Seeking God's will for your life. Seeking God's will for an unsaved neighbor that you know. And be able to love him as much as God loves you. Thank you, God. Amen. All right. I, uh, I thank Bill. I thank you for his testimony because I know that if Bill can have peace in the midst of his circumstances, I should be able to have peace in the midst of my circumstances. And I look at that last verse that he quoted. Again, the kingdom of heaven is under a treasure hidden in the field. And, and my take on that is, God is not looking for people who aren't seeking him. 
God's not looking for people who blend into the world. That his treasure, we have to seek him. We have to look for him. We have to find him. And then he says, it's worth everything. If you have to choose between the world and you have to choose between God, if you have to choose between your wealth and you have to choose between God, if you have to choose between anything and God, choose God. So I'm going to just make a, a little bit of an announcement before we go to communion. Next week, we're going to be speaking on hope, the second week of Advent. And we're going a little bit out of order. Uh, normally, the church starts with... Uh, the hope candle and we move to the peace candle we sort of switch that out but I'm going to give you some homework because the treasure's hidden and I want you to find it I want you to read the book of Ecclesiastes between now and next week if, if, and what we're going to be talking about how do you have hope when it's so hard to cope how do you have hope when it's so hard to cope and, and Ecclesiastes is a short book of the Bible it's only 12 chapters long and for you young people it's written by a man named Solomon, who was uh, considered to be the wisest man ever walked walk the earth besides Jesus himself. And in the book of Ecclesiastes, it's actually at the end we find that it's written to the young people who have the, their lives ahead of them. But if you're older, because when you read it when young, it don't always make sense. When you're older, the book of Ecclesiastes starts to make a whole lot of sense because it talks about the brevity of life. It's nothing but a vapor. And you wake up one day and you're 50 or 60 years old and you wonder where all those years went. Solomon says, you can have hope even when it's difficult to cope. And we'll talk about that next week. Now, I want to mention that because Bill spoke out of the King James today. I, I, I'm a simple man. I need a simple translation. So I normally speak out of the New Living Translation. And I'm going to do something that the board is probably not going to like. I'm going to say, if you don't have a Bible, and you would like to have a Bible. If you'd like to have a Bible in the translation that we use most often in this church, on those connection cards, just write that down, put it in the basket as you leave or as we're fellowshipping, and I will get you a Bible. I'll make sure you have it. There'll be no cost to you. I'll order them for you. The church will be glad to do that. And why do we do that? Because it's the time of Christmas. And Christmas is about giving, not receiving. Amen. Because we love you. We may not know you very well, but we love you. And God... And those that love, give, right? God said, I love the world, so I gave my son. People who love, give. And we'd love you to have a translation of a Bible that's easy to understand, particularly if you haven't done a lot of Bible reading in the past. So your homework this week is read the book of Ecclesiastes. And if you'd like to have a Bible, please see us, and we will make sure you get one. Just leave the card in the basket, and I'll order it this week, and I'll make sure you get it. This is the Lord's table. And I try to remind people, this is not the Odyssey's table. This is the Lord's table. And he welcomes all of those who believe to come and dine at his table. At the beginning of Advent, I couldn't think of a more proper time for us to celebrate what Christ has done for us. So if you believe, we ask you to join us at the table. And I'm going to ask uh, Diana and Bryce to come up and start playing. And we'll serve them right at the, while they're playing at the end before Bill and I serve. So the Lord invites us to his table. And think about this. I don't know about you. It, it, I was trying not to. I was trying to just hang on every word that Bill was speaking. But the smells from the kitchen were coming through. <laughs> Me too. And I thought about that. On the night in which he gave himself up, have you ever just tried to place yourself in that table around there? And what the smells must have been is, as they were getting ready to prepare for their Passover meal. On the night which he gave himself for us, and he took the bread and he gave thanks to the Father. He broke the bread, lifted it up, and said, Take ye, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And then after the supper was over, he took the juice.
Christ and will go and bring bread and fellowship together. So if you will, please come forward. Bill will administer 